Now we've more or less finished the basic stains that are required. So let's look at a few of the myopathies. Myopathies or primary muscle diseases are divided into these five broad categories of dystrophies, inflammatory myopathies, congenital myopathies, metabolic and toxic and drug related myopathies. At this point, you might want to know that is a biopsy always required to make a diagnosis of a myopathy. There are a handful of conditions which can be diagnosed without a biopsy with a good clinical examination and a molecular or genetic workup. Prime amongst them is Duchenne muscular dystrophy with which many of you may be familiar. Up to 70 or 75% of Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy can actually be diagnosed with clinical and molecular studies with a blood sample for mutational an analysis. And it doesn't need a biopsy. The other conditions where you can make a diagnosis without a biopsy are spinal muscular atrophy, myotonic dystrophy one, and facio-scapular humeral dystrophy. So these do not need a biopsy. And uh, I think we are lucky in that in, in the molecular area, we're really able to arrive at a diagnosis without an invasive procedure. So how then do we put together all these features that we see and arrive at the right diagnosis? A pattern-based approach is a little easier to follow because otherwise it can be confusing, especially because features are overlapping in all these entities. So a pattern-based approach um, was published in Modern Pathology in 2019, and I thought was a helpful would be a helpful guide for, um, for all of us, and I put it here. So depending on the pattern or the intensity of inflammation, these could be categorized into six categories, which I'll go through with one by one with an example, uh, with one or two examples in each category. So the first category is where you have active myopathic damage and inflammation. And the second, there's active damage without the inflammation. The third category is more chronic. When you have certain inclusions and vacuoles, that would fall into category four. If it's predominantly atrophic, then that comes into category five. And if you have a normal muscle, that would be category six. So I'll just deal with each of these categories briefly. Now, category one is when there's active muscle damage with associated inflammation. And this under this umbrella comes the large group of idiopathic inflammatory myopathies. This is an important diagnosis to make because many of them, uh, them can be treated. It is the treatable component. And having said that, the commonest of this group is inclusion body myositis, which is often resistant to routine steroid therapy and might need aggressive immunosuppression. And yet they may not respond. So it's very important to make the diagnosis right. The main uh, entities here would be inclusion body myositis, dermatomyositis, and overlap myositis. Uh, a word of caution here is that polymyositis, which was a common condition maybe a decade ago, is now almost non-existent because most, most of uh, the, this category have now been reclassified into each of these based on new diagnostic criteria that have been laid down by muscle groups world over. And uh, if the criteria applied uh, strictly, then less than 5% would actually fall into the true polymyositis group. So having got a general group like this, one has to be aware of few caveats. Sometimes dystrophies could have inflammation and therefore not all biopsies with inflammation are necessarily inflammatory myopathies. This is an example of an inclusion body myositis. And typically this was a 56 year old male who had weakness of the finger flexors. So the finger flex flexors were very weak and he wasn't able to touch the fingers to the palm or clench his fist tightly. And the muscle biopsy has a myopathic uh, pattern. As you can see, the size variation, there are internal nuclei and there is dense inflammation. So this is definitely a damaged muscle with a lot of inflammation and therefore it fits into category one. This is often accompanied by what are known as rimmed vacuoles. So you're lucky if you find them. They're not always seen in all biopsies. You get a cytoplasmic vacuole, which is rimmed by this basophilic debris. And that is highlighted in a homory strike home, as I mentioned earlier. And often, one has a lot of COX-deficient fibers. So if you have a cox SD stain with many COX-deficient fibers and these features, then you're probably dealing with an inclusion body myositis. Now, this is the example of a young girl, a five-year-old, who had a skin, typical skin rash and muscle weakness. And she had a biopsy with us, but she had been previously treated with steroids. So if you look at this muscle biopsy, this is one fascicle. This is one fascicle, and this is yet another fascicle. The periphery of the fascicle has these small atrophic fibers. All these are small atrophic fibers essentially located at the periphery and highlighted by this enzyme stain. You can see that all these dark fibers are small, and they're mostly located at the outer surface of the perifascicular area. 
So perifascicular atrophy in a child with rash is usually indicative of a dermatomyositis. Often in these children, in the untreated cases, you would typically get a perimycel vessel with a cuff of lymphocytes. But that was lacking in this child because she had been treated with steroids prior to the biopsy. And sometimes you get these rigid capillaries in the perimycel uh, comp uh, compartment, which is also indicative that there is something happening in this compartment. And this is an indicator that you're probably dealing with a dermatomyositis. The uh, criteria for diagnosis now are pretty stringent. And this is known to be an autoimmune disease with at least five different types of autoantibodies uh, identified as uh, in uh, this big group. Uh, with uh, some uh, some groups being more prone to malignancies, with some particular auto antibodies being associated with an increased risk of malignancies, IHC is helpful, as I mentioned earlier, MHC upregulation is seen. And if you have the access to electron microscopy, tubular reticular intrusions could be seen in these cases. Now, coming to the next group, which is active damage without inflammation. The prototype here is necrotizing autoimmune myopathy or NAM, otherwise known as immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. You can also have this in toxins and drugs related to opiates, alcohol, zirubodine, chloroquine, and statins as well. And some metabolic myopathies could also present with this, uh, with this pattern. This was the example of a 45-year-old lady who uh, presented, uh, presented to us with rhabdomyolysis. And this is the muscle biopsy. You can see these are normal fibers interspersed with numerous pale necrotic fibers. So myonecrosis, which is sort of almost diffuse, all these are necrotic fibers. So there are a lot of necrotic fibers. There is no inflammation. Despite so much necrosis, the one would have expected that the body would re respond with inflammation, but there's no inflammation. All you see are foci of regenerative fibers and some myofibrocytosis. So this is a typical pattern seen in necrotizing autoimmune myopathy. And as the name indicates, you have necrosis and it's autoimmune because Certain autoantibodies, the anti HMGCR and anti SRP, are known to be associated in this group. And uh, there is, however, a small group which is seronegative as well, which can present with these features. So that's the second group where you have damage without inflammation. Then coming to the third group, which includes the chronic myopathic changes. Again, I'll uh, be going through uh, the common entities. Most of you would be familiar with dystrophies. Dystrophies typically are chronic and uh, go on for a period of, uh, for a length of time before we see the biopsies and congenital myopathies would fall in this group. Apart from this, certain inflammatory myopathies like inclusion body could also have a chronic course. And I'm, I'm just putting it here to make the point that there can be considerable overlap between the groups. Though large majority would still adhere to the guidelines that we have, you could still have overlap and therefore close clinical correlation is extremely important to make the right diagnosis. This is the biopsy of a five-year-old child who had a hypertrophic calf muscles and a very high uh, creatinine phosphokinase. The CPK levels were in thousands, and we got the muscle biopsy. The low palm view just shows you the destruction of fascicular architecture and a lot of fat and fibrosis. Variation of fiber size is also evident at this uh, magnification. And at higher magnification, extreme variation in size, a lot of fibrous tissue, fat infiltration, rounded or hyalinized fibers, some splitting happened. This is a big fiber which has actually split across the center. So this is a split fiber. So these are essentially and fi fibers with central nuclei. So these are all in keeping with the myopathic features that I showed you earlier. Therefore, this myopathy with so much of fibrosis is equivalent to a dystrophy. But that really is a generic diagnosis. Beyond that, one can't make a diagnosis of a specific dystrophy on h &D alone. So one needs the, you, uh, the help of IHC stains especially dystrophin, as I had mentioned earlier, for confirmation of diagnosis. This is yet another case just to show you. This was a young lady who was born to a father who had limb girdle, uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, and she had developed muscle weakness, and the muscle biopsy showed this. There's, again, a lot of fat infiltration, so there is chronicity, and this is a myopathic picture with variation fiber size. There were what, what are called world fibers, and those were seen better on SDH stain. So while one could say that this could be a limb girdle muscular dystrophy, one really can't confirm without the use of immunistic chemical stains. And just for your information, IHC on muscle is done on the cryosections. So a battery of stains would have to be run to arrive at the exact type of limb girdle muscular dystrophy that we're dealing with. In this group of chronic myopathic changes, we also have the congenital myopathies because these are chronic and they often are slowly progressive. 
So you uh, and the entities in this, uh, the commoner ones are centronuclear myopathy. And I put this picture here just to show you that as the name indicates, there are numerous fibers with central nuclei. Normal muscle usually have peripheral nuclei, but in this almost 80 to 90% of fibers would have central nuclei. And so this is one congenital myopathy perhaps where the HND itself is a giveaway to the diagnosis. On the other hand, we have central core diseases where a diagnosis, the HND may look completely normal and the diagnosis can only be made on these enzyme stains where you have areas devoid of enzyme activity appearing like cores and hence the name central core disease. So that brings us to the next category, category four, myopathies with inclusions. The biggest group here are the mitochondrial myopathies where you can get aggregates of mitochondria and that's how you make the diagnosis by recognizing them. And I will show you some pictures. Nemelin myopathy also has aggregates of rods which are picked up by special stains and vacuolar myopathies in the storage disorders where, you, where the muscle will show vacuoles, be it glycogen or lipid storage. And there are the other rarer groups where you can get inclusions or vacuoles. Now, this is a picture of a mitochondrial myopathy. This was a lady who was 36 years old who had ptosis and a muscle biopsy was submitted. And you can, I hope by now, recognize that this is myopathy. There are central nuclei with variation of fiber size. This is a focus of myonecrosis and myophagocytosis. But in addition, what we are seeing are these fibers called granular fibers. So granular fibers are the HND counterpart of red ragged fibers, which I showed you earlier, seen on Gomori strain. And the blue ragged fibers and Cox deficient fibers are a very important component of mitochondrial myopathy because Cox is an enzyme, is a mitochondrial enzyme. So absence of or deficiency of Cox activity is equivalent to mitochondrial myopathy. However, in aging also, in elderly individuals, you could get some Cox deficient fibers. So close cl clinical, clinical correlation is extremely important. Now, this is a biopsy of a young child who on the, if you can see, the HND, except for mild variation in fiber size and some fib uh, adipose tissue infiltration, doesn't show too much. But there's a beautiful, uh, beautiful appearance of these rods seen on the Gomori trichrome. This is the hallmark of Nemelin disease. As you can see, these are these red, small rods and dot-like inclusions. This is a picture taken under oil immersion for your benefit, and uh, and. This is, uh, this is a typical picture of Nemelin myopathy. Nemelin myopathy got its name from the Greek word Nema by the people who described it initially, who thought these were threads. And Nema is the Greek word for thread. So that's where it got its name. This is a picture which shows various types of vacuoles. And this is, uh, since I just put them all together, which could range from inflammatory to dystrophies, to neurogenic atrophies, to even storage disorders. And the most common thing is a freeze artifact, which one needs to keep in mind while looking at, at this group of uh, muscle diseases. Now, category five, uh, five is one where you see mainly atrophic changes. And if one has excluded neurogenic atrophy, then atrophy can be seen in a perifascicular manner, as I showed you in dermatomyositis. And you could have selective atrophy of these various fibers, which could indicate certain diagnosis, which I'll come to now in the next few slides. And of course, in any myopathy or neurogenic process, you could have scattered atrophic fibers, and that won't really tell you what you're dealing with, and maybe just a non-specific phenomenon. So the top two rows are neurogenic atrophy, which I've already dealt with earlier. Let's look at what type two atrophy looks like. In an adult, this is an ATP stain at 9.6. So type one fibers are pale, type two are dark. And the type 2 are distinctly smaller than the type 1 fibers. So type 2 atrophy in adults is a fairly non-specific finding, which could be seen either due to disuse or even steroid use, and doesn't really have any other connotation. But in children, if you get atrophy of type 1 type, here the light fibers are type 1, and you can see these are much smaller compared to type 2, and the patient is a child, then you're probably dealing with a congenital myopathy. Whereas the same thing, if it is an adult patient, you have type 1 atrophy, you are probably dealing with a myotonic dystrophy. So it's very important to carefully evaluate, correlate with clinical findings, and evaluate these enzyme stains to arrive at the right diagnosis. And of course, the bane of the reporting pathologist is to get a normal biopsy. What do you do when the muscle looks entirely normal? The muscle is normal possibly because the symptoms are not because of the muscle disease. The reason for the weakness could be somewhere else, could be something else or the disease actually does not affect the muscle chosen. So it's a wrong muscle which has been biopsied. Alternatively, these invo uh, the involvement can be patchy, 
and the biopsy could have been taken from could be a very small sample which is non-representative apart from this there are actually some muscle diseases which can look completely normal in light microscopy and they would actually need ancillary techniques like electron microscopy enzyme studies biochemical evaluation and genetics to arrive at the right diagnosis